While I was packing, I spent a long time trying to figure out how to categorize all the stuff I keep in the closet and barely use, but I eventually decided it was probably better to just donate it all. Turns out the bin is mightier than the sort. Hi there, my name's Josh and this is Thunk. Nice shelves, aren't they? It's been so long, I figured you'd forgotten by now. I recently moved to Houston, Texas, and it's come with all sorts of hiccups that have made it hard to start recording again. A hurricane hit the first week I was here, knocking out power and internet. Someone broke into the back of my car and stole all my recording equipment. And my apartment has been full of boxes. Lots and lots of boxes. Like this one, which I very helpfully labeled Dog Bowl Etc. Obviously, this was one of those frantic last minute packing jobs, but when you're trying to convert a forest of cardboard into a livable space, this sort of thing can stop you dead in your tracks as you wonder, where on earth am I going to put the etc? Box labels are a good example of what information architecture theorist Robert Glushko calls an organizing system, an imposed intentional structure designed to facilitate some interaction with a set of resources. Library catalogs, takeout menus, MP3 folders, subway maps, each of these is engineered to help a person interface with a large collection of things and do something with them. The most obvious being retrieval. That is, when you know the thing you need, you can locate and get to it quickly. Like any technology, a really good system can become a transparent extension of the user's will, vanishing from our awareness as we grow accustomed to its operation, the same way we don't really think about steering wheels or computer keyboards while we're using them. That goes double for organizing systems, because whenever you interact with them, your attention is probably focused on whatever you're looking for, not the tool you're using to retrieve it. So long as you find the spatula in the drawer where you expect it to be, you don't have to think about the set of categories you've carefully mapped onto the physical space of your kitchen. It only really pops into our awareness when it doesn't work the way we're expecting. Maybe that blind spot is why we don't usually think about these systems beyond how well they enable retrieval, despite the fact that they don't just point at information, they contain information. There are inevitably choices and values baked into them, encoding all sorts of interesting things. For example, you've probably used the periodic table of elements in a science class at some point, and spent longer than you'd like hunting around for silicon or something. If it were only a tool to look up atomic features of elements, surely an alphabetical list would be a lot easier to work with. But the information is organized this way to capture certain chemical properties revealing patterns and similarities between elements through their relative positions. It also contains subtler information about human eyesight, printing, and elemental abundance. The relatively rare lanthanides and actinides are split out so the figure's text will be readable if you fit it on a book page. You've probably stared at this thing for years in various chemistry and science classrooms, and it might not have occurred to you that this is just one possible way to organize elements. The left step periodic table is also fairly popular compactly arranging the elements according to their outermost electron orbitals. Peña and Guerra's periodic spiral removes any artificial line breaks in the sequence of increasing atomic weights, while illustrating the dual alkali and halogen nature of hydrogen. Timothy Stowe's physicist periodic table uses a series of flat planes to represent electron energy levels, with different colors indicating different electron shells in each level. Yes, each of these figures allows retrieval of an element's name from its atomic number, or vice versa, but they also encode unique data about all this other stuff, illustrating or ignoring certain features of the landscape of elements, and the one that is best for your purposes will depend a lot on what you're trying to do. Once you start looking for that subtler layer of information embedded in any organizing structure, some of it starts to jump out at you. The takeout menu doesn't just tell us what things we can order, it tells us what order we should eat them in. The way kitchen cabinets are organized doesn't just tell us which categories of kitchen tools go together, but which ones are most frequently accessed, what sort of cuisine the cook likes best, and how high of a shelf they can reach without a step stool. Disrupting that internal structure makes it hard to find stuff, sure, but it also damages the knowledge baked into that system. Hierarchies, sequences, and affinities only exist in the relationships between items when they're arranged in a particular fashion. Vandalizing or corrupting those frameworks erases knowledge about their contents, which is often just as necessary as the objects themselves to be useful. Even the greatest novel would be nonsensical if the order of its contents were randomized. Unfortunately, it's not always easy or even possible to see what's being encoded in the spaces between organized objects, what hidden logic governs that structure, which can make it harder to judge whether some other organizing principles might be better. 
We might also wonder if the invisible information stored in an organizing system is accurate. But unless the people who formulated that system volunteer an explanation as to why it is the way it is, we can't readily access those organizing principles. To get around this, it can be helpful to examine what the system enables its users to do, what powers it grants, which interactions it supports. For example, the Mercator projection turns out to be extraordinarily useful for sailing by compass. The places where the map is heavily distorted, the North and South Poles, aren't popular sailing destinations, and it lets you plot a course just by drawing a straight line. Steer the ship so the compass matches the line's angle, and you'll probably get where you're going. This organizing system for the Earth's surface facilitated the age of sail, colonization, naval warfare, and trade between regions that were previously isolated. On the other hand, the Mercator's polar distortion makes it hilariously misleading when it comes to comparing land masses at different latitudes, suggesting absurd things like Greenland is the same size as the continent of Africa. Put another way, the information contained in the Mercator projection empowers sailing and impedes size comparison of countries. It would be hard to characterize those strengths and weaknesses by just staring at the map or judging it by how good it is for retrieval. Sure, it'll tell you the names of various regions and where they're located with respect to other regions, but the information it encodes in the relationships between places is invisible until you evaluate it within the context of the activities that it's good and not so good for. This is sort of a pragmatic move, allowing us to sidestep debates about whether or not some organizing system is accurate, which can get into the weeds of endless definitions and genre battles, and to engage directly with what that taxonomy does. The racial hierarchy laid out in the Nuremberg Laws, sorting people into categories based on Jewish ancestry, is pseudoscientific nonsense in about 50 different ways. But we don't have to cite the willful irrationality of Nazi race science, the arbitrary nature of categories, or anything like that. Sorting people in this way makes it quick and easy to single them out based on their heritage and deny them rights. That is really the only activity this framework enables. Even if it had any scientific or historical basis, that feature makes it a bad organizing system. Which leads me back to my own less bad organizing system. A comprehensive categorization of every object I own and an inventory of every box that got packed would have certainly helped with retrieval. I've spent more time than I would like wandering back and forth through my apartment hunting for something that was either stuffed into the wrong box or hidden in an etc. box. But it strikes me that, by moving, I've already erased a ton of information by disrupting the usual arrangement of these objects. I can't set up my camera tripod on the usual dimple in the carpet. I can't casually lean over from my desk and refill my water bottle the way I'm used to. The organizing framework I've improvised for this new space will undoubtedly evolve and improve over time, but operating without the crystallized knowledge that's usually encoded into my environment compels me to ask, what exactly do I want this new organizing framework to help me do? Really, we can ask the same of any organizing system, from textbooks and product reviews to economies and governments. What is being organized? Who is it being organized for? And what does that framework empower them to do? For my new apartment, I suppose I could make a spreadsheet of every one of my possessions and where they're stored and technically call it all sorted. But while retrieval is important, the actual thing I want my belongings to do is to remember what I want to do. Maybe forgetting a little of what I usually do will be good for that. If I don't find myself paralyzed without the contents of the etc. box, maybe they're not as important as I imagined when I packed them. Newton should have his bowls, though. What are the most visible and invisible organizing systems you interact with on a daily basis? What sort of activities do they facilitate by retaining some memory? Please leave a comment below and let me know what you think. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to blah blah, subscribe, blah, share, and don't stop thinking.